Losing a child is a parent's worst nightmare. As a children's hospice, Emily's House provides comfort for families living with those realities day in and day out. I visited the Toronto-based care centre to understand those challenges, but also the challenge of raising money for a cause that's difficult to talk about. We'd miss him, but uh, you know he didn't have to. He didn't have to fight anymore. It's so far-fetched to think that your child would go through all this before one. I didn't want her to die in a hospital. I wanted her to at least see a bit of the world. I often get asked the question, "How do we do it? How do we work here?" We want to pack as much life as we can into their days because we can't add days to their life. You don't know, we, none of us know when our time is going to come. Can't say it enough that Emily's house was our haven. It's a special place for kids, kids with complex conditions, kids who are dying. Since opening its doors six years ago, Emily's house has been offering end of life and respite care to families and their children. When a child is born, we're there for them. The system is there for them, family is there for them, friends are there for them. We celebrate their birth. Well, in the same way, somebody's got to be there uh, when that person is leaving uh, this earth. Emily's House is one of only two dedicated children's hospices in Ontario. Often families were the ones that are providing 24-7 care for their children and weren't getting respite breaks. And children that were terminally ill and dying often were in ICU or died in emergency rooms. And so we saw the need to build a children's hospice to offer extra supports for these families. We were told that she had obviously suffered some kind of trauma while she was in my tummy, um, and that there was a possibility that she was going to be a stillbirth, and we just happened to catch it before she passed away. The toughest thing you're ever going to hear in your life. I, uh, you feel numb, you feel like, you know, this can't be real, obviously I have to be dreaming right now. They didn't know exactly how long we would have. We could have a couple days, we could have a week, we could have weeks. The minute we walked through the door, um, it felt like home. They were excited to see us and to meet Grace. Uh, they were ooing and aahing over her, and it was the first time since she was born that I actually felt like a mother. We were able to have adventures with her and do things that we had dreamed about doing with her while she was here. I was able to watch a hockey game with my daughter. Just having that opportunity to, to watch that game, it gives me a memory that I'll never ever be able to lose. Grace lived for a total of eight days, and to celebrate her short life and keep her memory alive, her family runs an annual hockey tournament in her name, with proceeds going to Emily's house. This is a place that you don't want to be unless you need to be here, but when you need to be here, you're very, very happy that it exists. Matthew was a, a very happy boy. He was always laughing. He had the cutest giggle. Through his 18 years, he uh, had a number of struggles. Bruno and I came and had a tour of Emily's house and it was, we just thought, oh, this is great. It really felt like a home. You'll notice the kitchen is right in the center of the room and that's where most houses, that's the way it's laid out. The kitchen is the center of the room. It's the center of uh, activity. We could have our Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner here. We celebrated Easter here. We celebrated uh, his birthday here, his uh, 18th birthday. He defied predictions, doctor's predictions or anyone's predictions on uh, uh, on how long he'd live. He opened his eyes wide, like it was like, I said, Bruno, his eyes are wide open. And he looked at us both as if to say, thank you, I love you, goodbye. And he took his last breath and it was like, so peaceful. A hospice not only provides support for sick children and their parents, but also for their siblings. We really wanted a space for um, siblings to feel um, welcomed. They'll go down there with a, a volunteer or um, someone just to, who'd be able to connect with them. In case you don't want to be there while they're in pain or something like that, then they just go do separate things. But we did do stuff together here. Some kids, they might just uh, think it's like a hospital where you just sit around and just wait, whereas here the staff will like, they'll try to do things with you and they'll like help you a lot. Emily's house operates 24 hours with a central nursing station on the second floor. It has 10 beds for both end of life care and respite patients. The children have complex conditions, including cardiac and genetic diseases. 
first two, three years, I used to beat up myself so hard. I used even to question, why am I here? Is this for me? Is this job for me? I'm a mother, so being a mother and having five children, and the youngest is a special need too, so for me, I won't lie, it's tough and challenging. We also have our respite programs, which are for families that have been diagnosed with a life-limiting um, illness. Their medical needs are quite unique, um, and so they, they can really benefit from um, medical care and, and needs so that the families can get some rest. From 11 months on, I became the mother of a special needs child. Kanisha McLeod has been taking her daughter, 15-year-old Kiara, to Emily's house for the past five years. The respite here has been a godsend for our family because um, when we needed it, it was right here. When she's here, I know she's safe, she's super loved, everybody here loves her, so that's um, a plus. She's having fun. Volunteers are a big part of that. Emily's house offers various therapy programs like music and art. They also have a sensory room to help engage children through lights, colors, sounds and smells. Whether they wanted to hang out with me, whether they wanted to sit and watch TV or have me read to them or sing to them, whatever the case may be, um, I was there for them. Whether you have siblings, mom, dad, grandparents, whatever the case may be, everyone is impacted by it. And I think the opportunity to help them feel a little bit of normality in a not so normal situation is huge. I have a huge respect for the nurses and what they deal with. We work alongside them. Uh, they don't give us direction, but they'll always be there for a suggestion. Uh, the way they help each other and are very sensitive to the children, it's, it's stunning. Emily's house sees about 400 admissions a year. Roughly 70 of those are for end-of-life care. We have challenging days. Days that are more difficult than others but we have a strong support system here at Emily's House. Um, we're essentially a big family. The hospice receives half of their funding from the province, and the other half of their budget comes from fundraising, which can be a challenge. Often, uh, fundraising is easier when you're putting it towards research and putting it towards cure, but what about care? And that's a little bit different and more difficult to fundraise for. When you're talking about palliative care, specifically pediatric palliative care. I'm incredibly inspired um, by every child that comes through Emily's house doors. You know, these, these kids, they go through more in their short lives than some adults I know. And still they are able to love unconditionally and fight with a resilience that I have never seen before. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.